Well, I got some lessons in handling this microphone, so I'm not going to fight with it <laughs> today. I want to say some words of thanks to all of you for these days together. Um, this is my last lecture, so I'm done with my work when I finish. I, I uh, rejoice in you. I look forward to this each year, and I go home with my heart full of thanks. Some of you have become dear, dear friends, and I rejoice in you and your faithfulness to God's Word and His promises. I know that He has preserved you amidst lots of difficulty and has made you salty so that you can be salt and light and leaven in a Norway that seems to have lost its way. So I pray for your blessing here and in Denmark, and I pray that God will grant you his peace so that you can continue faithfully in the mission that he has given you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you have called us to take up the cross and follow you. If you seek this from us, we pray that you yourself will place the cross upon us so that we will not deceive ourselves or be deceived by the evil one, but might bear what you have given and serve as you have called. <coughs> Bless us in our vocations <coughs> as we go about our work and grant us faithfulness, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so I ate a peanut before I started notes. I'm not fighting with the microphone, but the peanut is after me. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Karl Barth, uh, the great Calvinist theologian, once called preaching words in search of the word. One of the characteristics of the gospel is that for all of its spillage, for all of its quality of overwhelming and overtaking us, it can sometimes become very elusive. You have experienced this undoubtedly, of uh, being in circumstances or a situation where you have the sense that the gospel is demanded of you. And you speak, and you seek, and you declare, and it falls flat, it apparently. It sounds like the law. It doesn't have the force of the gospel. This is the most frustrating thing about the ministry. Pastors above all should be quick with the gospel. It should be on the tip of our tongue and often enough it is. But sometimes we have the opposite experience of seeking it, of looking for it and not finding it or apparently. Sometimes it seems that the gospel is overheard as often as it's heard. It has this, it's like the manna, it doesn't keep. <laughs> it demands to be fresh and new, and because of that we have sometimes difficulty keeping up with it, and keeping up with its freshness. So, um, I said sometimes I, I'm getting old myself now, but lots of my father's contemporaries are still around and I oftentimes sit and visit with them and they oftentimes say yesterday's gospel is today's law. Yesterday's gospel is today's law. What yesterday had great power and force today becomes flat and so we we search for the gospel we seek to proclaim it 
And so we don't memorize pat phrases or collect paragraphs that we can use, but we sometimes we talk about it this way. We talk about a grammar. That is, you know how a grammar works. A grammar organizes language so that you can speak the language effectively. And so we have a grammar of grace, a grammar of the gospel, some basic rules for seeking the gospel to declare it, so that when we speak the gospel, it comes as a gracious and freeing word and doesn't go flat on us and doesn't fall flat on our, uh, uh, in front of us. So, um, we're going to work through this lecture, a little grammar of grace. We're going to start by making a distinction between two different structures of words. If then kinds of words, and because therefore kinds of words. The gospel usually is a because therefore kind of word that takes us beyond conditions. So that's the first thing that we'll do is explore that distinction. It's a form of the distinction between law and gospel. A little simpler though. And then I'm going to give you four rules for the grammar of grace. And we'll talk them through one by one. First of all, two different grammatical constructions. The first one is an if-then kind of statement. This is the most common use of language in the state and in the church. Um, the if describes a condition that has to be fulfilled. And the then, if then, describes the reward or the consequence or the benefit from filling the condition. This is the first language that many children know, learn. If you want your dessert, then you have to eat your vegetables. My oldest son was uh, like lots of older children. He was feisty and rebellious. I was teaching him to eat peas. And I had mashed the peas with the fork and I piled them up on the fork and I, he decided that he was not going to join the pea eaters. He w had no interest in peas and so I held up the peas to his mouth. <laughs> he clamped his mouth shut. I said, Jake or Andrew, you have to eat your peas. He clamped it more tightly. Finally, he started to cry and he opened his mouth. <laughs> and I, che I cheated. <laughs> Stuck a load in and dropped it on his tongue. Huh? He screamed and screamed. The peas didn't move. His little tongue held them in place. He didn't swallow a bit. And finally, he had when he had won his victory, I removed the peas and he spit out this word. My want to do what my can do. Hmm? That's the slogan of the old Adam. I want to do what I can. Huh? So here my little sinner proved huh, his legacy. Huh? There it was right in front of me. Um, if then, if you do this, then you will get that. And so, you know all kinds of words like this. If you want to exercise the rights of citizenship, you must pay your taxes. If you want to go to the doctor, hmm, you have to uh, keep up your health care. If you want to pass a grade in school, you must do your assignments. There are whole mountains of if-then statements that we negotiate our way through each day. Fulfill, seek, running into conditions that we have to fulfill, fulfilling them, and then going. if we don't fulfill them, one of two things happens. 
We don't get the reward we hope for, or we get the punishment that we sought to avoid. Some years ago, we flew into Bergen, and we were going to drive down to Reesness, where my wife's family comes from, down in Fleckefjord. And I didn't know about the photo police. <laughs> I rented a car, and I learned. <laughs> I started getting messages from the police and from the rental agency. I was driving too fast. I thought Norway was surprisingly lax on the traffic enforcement, and I learned from the car rental agency that they were a lot quicker than I imagined. Huh? I paid. Uh, if you break the law, then you pay the consequences. If you obey the law, you don't have similar trouble. There are many of these kinds of statements in Scripture. To begin with, there are ten of them. The commandments. Each of the commandments is set up as an if-then. If you're going to have a God, you only can have one, the first commandment. If you if you have a god, you have to keep it. You, you have to. Uh, uh, you, you can't take his name in vain. If you have a god, then you have to stop once a week and hear from him. Huh? We go through a whole series of commandments that set conditions, and we re recognize the conditions, and we seek obedience to the conditions. They are so ingrained in most of us that we don't stop to think about them. But we live in a culture now that has lost touch with the commandments. When I was first teaching um, in St. Paul, Minnesota, I could tell jokes about the commandments and people laughed. When I retired from teaching, they would count on their fingers and about a five minutes later, somebody would giggle. Huh? So I told a story about a, a pastor who lost his bicycle. And the priest told him that he should preach a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments and convict the thief, and the thief would return the bicycle. So he preached, and he, he, he came back, and he was riding the bicycle, and the priest said, I told you it would work. And he said, well, it worked a little differently than you thought. He said, I, I got to the Sixth Commandment, and I remembered where I'd left my bicycle. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to know. You have to know the commandments to get the joke. <laughs> And so my students, they, they would be counting, and then somebody would giggle, and they... <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, we, we have lost the commandments in our public life. And so the part of our calling as the church is to restore the commandments to their proper place, to teach them to our children, as Deuteronomy says, to, to, to post them in our family life so that that they're learned. They're, these if-then statements are part and parcel of our public life and condition it, and we have to know that. But for all the good that the commandments will do, for all the good that if-then statements do, they can't make faith. If-then statements will not make faith. If then statements will state the condition, and if you study it carefully and apply yourself, you've got a good chance of keeping the condition. But the problem with if then statements is that they make you watch yourself instead of your neighbor. You see? You watch the commandment instead of your neighbor and start measuring yourself against the commandment instead of helping the neighbor. It's like going to a movie and say, are we having fun yet? That's usually a pretty good sign that you're not paying attention to the movie and that the movie is a bad one. Huh? This time of year, we're, it used to be that Americans would be preoccupied with baseball. And so, 
we would go to baseball games. My gra great grandpa and my grandpa and I, we would go to baseball games and we'd sit in a row and watch one baseball game after another. And we'd get lost in the baseball games. That's all we thought about. It's like good football, European football. You watch the game and you don't think about watching the game. You're watching the game so well that you don't even think about the time. Huh? But if you start thinking about the time, you know, this is a bad game. <laughs> it's not working, you see. Well, the same with the commandment. <clears throat> when, when they're really working, you lose yourself. But if you're forever watching yourself, you become so self-conscious that they undermine. In faith, he who seeks his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you're working on losing yourself, something's wrong. Something's gone desperately wrong, you see? What happens? You get taken up. I little, have a little grandson now, you know, who's... This is the first time I've mentioned him, I think. He's... That's an accident. <laughs> He's six months old. He's half Norwegian and half German, and I'm working desperately on the German part to keep it. <laughs> he wants to march. I have to teach him not to march. <laughs> he lives down by Frankfurt. He's a, just a wonderful little boy. And he's... Um, we, we will go to see him in a couple weeks. So our hearts are preoccupied with him. When we are watching our little grandson, we don't need to pay attention to ourselves. Huh? We pay attention to him. That's the way it goes. You see, you lose yourself in the other. And these if-then statements they tell you, you better watch that boy. But they don't help you, they just get in your way. You have to be told, that's for sure. Hmm? But, the commandment is not going to deliver the goods. There's another kind of word in scripture. It's easily passed over, and many people are surprised by this word. Because it's an alien word. It's a strange word. It's a word that's generally outside of our experience, though it sometimes comes into our experience. This word does not require an if. It starts with a because. Because you are loved, you are free. Hmm? Because God loves you, he will forgive you. You can count on it. See? There's a condition but the difference between this kind of word and the first kind of word is that the condition doesn't depend on you. The condition is established by the one who cares for you. Because God loves you, you are free. The deepest words in human life are because therefore kinds of words. If then kind of words cast you back on yourself, you look at yourself and say, am I doing that? Will I ever do that? Hmm? I hope and pray that I do do that. Because therefore words, focus your attention on the other. Hmm? Hmm. They focus your attention on the other. Listen to the second beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Hmm? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. That's a because therefore kind of statement. Jesus is not telling you that you ought to go out and become poor in spirit. That you should work on achieving poverty of spirit. And when you have become poor in spirit, you'll be blessed. No, he is saying something entirely different. He's making a promise to you. Sometimes, in very special circumstances, I've preached on this proverb, or this beatitude, at the funeral of suicides. 
There is no more desperate poverty of spirit than to begin to think of death as a friend. Hmm. There is no worse suffering than to think that the only way I can be released from this suffering is to kill myself. And I have been at funerals where this, this word has been the only word that has helped because Christ Jesus himself is coming to minister to the poor in spirit. He's not saying you should become rich. You should work on your poverty and overcome it. If only you... No, 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 no. He's saying, blessed are you. Blessed are you. You can go through each of the Beatitudes this way. Because he blesses you. He makes the situation right. He takes responsibility. He takes authority. And he provides the blessing. You see? Because, therefore... Because I love you, therefore I bless you. It's out of your hands. Hmm. So here's a blessing that you have received re recently. This is my body given for you. Hmm. This is the New Testament in my blood shed for you. Hmm. What is that? That's not a law. It doesn't tell you to go and do something. It doesn't scold you for not having accomplished something. It blesses you. Hmm? It bless you are blessed. You are being given. Hmm? The body of Christ given for you. You can remember hearing this word in all kinds of difficult circumstances. Hmm? times of sorrow. Just before I left, I went to the hospital in Salem, Oregon and called on a man who had learned that his cancer is terminal. I brought along a communion kit that was given to me by the first pastor that serves the congregation. He was a chap on the during the Second World War. And he carried that communion kit through the Second World War and through his whole ministry. And when he came to the end of his ministry, he gave it to me. And so I carry it with me in the car. And when my pastor can't keep up with the whole congregation, he sends me to the older people, my pastor in Oregon. And so I heard that my friend had had this bad word and I went to the hospital with him and I took that old communion kit and I dipped the wafer in the wine and I put it on his tongue and I said, the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. That's pure promise. That's the gospel word. Hmm? That's the gospel word. The gospel word doesn't say if then. Moses likes to say if then. He's just full of if thens. If you let Moses loose, he'll just keep multiplying ifs and thens until he's tried to, he's got the whole world wrapped up in string. Huh? But when Christ begins to speak, what does he say? Because therefore, because I love you. So we know this about the gospel word. There might be times and circumstances where a command might actually be freeing. Huh? Sometimes when I scolded my kids, my boys, I had three feisty boys. Sometimes when I had to punish them, I would say afterwards, would you mind going over to the grocery store and picking up a loaf of bread? Hmm? Then they would run joyfully. <laughs> the command was freeing. They knew they were trusted once more. But most of the time if I said, would you go get some bread? I'll think about it. <laughs> hmm? huh? You see, that's how commands work. Most of the time, practically always, the gospel is going to be a because therefore. Christ takes hold of it and he fulfills the condition and you benefit. 
You get the result. That happened in your baptism. That happens in the Lord's Supper. It happens, it's hap it happens in the pro proclamation of the word. And you know these kinds of words because when you hear these kinds of words, you say, good. <laughs> I'll take that. I love it. There you receive the benefit. So we can say this about the grammar of the gospel. Generally, it's going to be a because therefore kind of statement. Because Christ loves you, therefore your sin is forgiven. Because Christ loves you, he's going to raise you from the dead. Because Christ loves you, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus your Lord. You see, there's, the gospel word is generally going to have that kind of structure. So when you go to call on a sick friend, when you visit somebody in trouble, when you bring a word of comfort and release, you can begin there. You can say, at least I'm not going to give commands. You can say this much, I'm going to give promises. Because in promises, you're speaking Christ's word, and you can depend on him to fulfill them. So that's a little bit of a start. Can we go any further with this? I'm going to suggest four rules for the grammar of the gospel. Four rules for speaking the gospel word. Um, these are not rules which are ready-made, where you fill in the blanks and it works. We're, we're fishing. Huh? I mean, when, when you're fishing, you don't dump the tackle box on the lake and go home and say, well, they weren't biting. Huh? You try here and you try there, and this is the, the lovely part about being a witness. You get to try different words, and finally one that uh, one of those words sticks. You see, so four rules. First of all, when the gospel word is spoken, Christ Jesus is the subject of the verbs. Christ Jesus is the actor. Christ Jesus is the one who is working. One of the assignments I used to give to my students was to go through the Gospel of Mark and underline the subject in each sentence and the verb in each sentence. So you underline the, sen the subject once and you underline the verb twice and then you spread out the direct objects and so on and so forth. By the time they had gotten through the first chapter or the second chapter of Mark, the students would always say the same thing, I see what you mean. Because when you read the Gospel of Mark, you notice almost right away, Christ is the subject of almost every verb. If he's not the subject of the verb, it's because somebody is going to help him become the subject of the verb pretty soon. Huh? So, for instance, in the Gospel of Luke, or the Gospel of uh, John, when he tells the servants to fill the six stone water jars. So, well, they do something, all right. They fill the jars. But you all know what's going to happen afterwards. Jesus is going to turn water into wine. And it won't be because those guys were applied themselves successfully in filling the stone water jars. It will be because he's so gracious that he can't quit. He spills himself. Huh? He gives himself. And so he bestows himself. So it's rare that he's not the subject of the verb. In the preaching of the gospel, he is invariably the subject. He is the one who's working. So when you go to, the go when you go to speak the gospel to someone, you don't say something like this. Well, if you're good, you've got a fighting chance, he might show up and help you. What's happened? You've become the subject of the verb. Huh? And Christ Jesus is something like Alfred Hitchcock in one of his own movies. He's, he's a dim presence in the background that you might catch if you look closely. Huh? 
Lots of preaching like is like this. The preacher reads the text and right away starts talking about your behavior. Christ disappears. Hmm? I've had uh, the joy of having two wonderful pastors. One is with us. Um, this never happens with them. But it happens when we visit around a little bit. I, Carolyn and I go to some church when we're traveling someplace and we sit down and the preacher reads the text and he st stands up and starts in on us about our behavior. And then I can feel Carolyn's arm starts to move and she's her hand is hovering over my knee and I know the clamp is going to start. Shut up, Jim. Shut up, Jim. <laughs> I mean, I don't like that preaching and sometimes I get kind of irritable, though I've never done what she did. Once we, once we went to a church and the pastor skipped the absolution, Carolyn stood up and said, Pastor, you might realize that there are sinners here. <laughs> We're waiting to hear of Christ's forgiveness. Will you pronounce the absolution so we can get on with things? <laughs> I was so proud of her. I, thought, <laughs> I mean, this is a true Christian wife. Huh? She, she was out there to get the absolution. This is a great thing. Huh? So, um, when the subject changes, when Christ Jesus is no longer the subject and you or the church or the bishop or the pastor or the church council, when, uh, when the subject changes, you're in trouble. Because when the subject changes, it's no longer Christ who's working in this word, it's somebody else. And then, good luck. Because you don't know for sure anymore. We can only be certain if Christ Jesus is the worker. When Christ Jesus is the worker, he will never fail us. But if somebody else takes over, you're taking your chances. So the grammar of the gospel focuses on Christ Jesus. It focuses on his work and what he does. Watch him in the gospels. He's preaching up in Capernaum. And some other people get the action momentarily. He's preaching. And they're crawling up on a thatched roof. Can you imagine? He's preaching and these four men have got a paralytic with them. And they're dragging him up on the roof. You can imagine all the noise. I mean you can imagine what Jesus thought. What in the world's going on on the roof? And pretty soon the thatch is opened and here they are lowering this paralytic down in front of Jesus. I just love it, you know. I mean, that's such a beautiful picture. Here's Jesus preaching away and here comes a paralytic lowering like he's in an elevator. And when he comes down, they put him right in front of He gets right in the way of all the people who are listening and watching and they put him right in front of Jesus like they're serving him up for dinner. Huh? And what does Jesus say? Your sins are forgiven. Huh? That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say what? Don't go back up by the elevator. Huh? Rise. Take up your pallet and walk. And what does the paralytic do? He doesn't say, I need some practice. Would you send me to a therapist for the moment? Would you at least let me gain some strength in my legs again? Huh? He stands up, picks up his pallet, puts it under his arm, and walks out. A whole and free. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. He's the worker. He is doing and accomplishing and being. He is freeing and healing. You see that again? I always love it in that same chapter that Jesus goes to Simon Peter's mother-in-law. I have a wonderful mother-in-law. But sometimes she has a little difficulty with boundaries. She's strong 
as any Norwegian woman you ever met. Huh? And she doesn't like fences. And so if we let her, she'll take over everything. Huh? So the first thing Peter did was to go and heal P Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Simon Peter said, thank goodness. <laughs> I mean, this is the fun of the Gospels, right? Jesus is doing. Huh? He's healing the sick. He's curing diseases. He's driving out demons. Pretty soon we'll see him raising the dead. Huh? This is Jesus. He's sovereign. He's powerful. And he does his work. And when you read him, he is the subject of the verb. Almost invariably. One of the best of these stories is um, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Huh? Jesus got word, got word that Lazarus was sick, so he went further away for four days. What do you suppose is going to happen? Well, what did happen? Lazarus died. So after he'd been dead a couple days, Jesus showed up. This is what Martha said. If you're going to be the savior of the world, you're going to have to learn to keep your appointments. Where have you been? <laughs> Martha's the aggressive one. Mary's the passive aggressive one. Martha goes right down the road and takes him by the ear and Mary hangs behind him and she says, Lord, if you had only been here, <laughs> I'd rather have Martha any day, right? I mean, she's right after him. And what does Jesus do? Huh? What does Jesus do? He does the strangest thing you can imagine. He goes to the door of the tomb and he says, open it. Then Martha has a fit. He stinketh. Huh? <laughs> she knows what's going to happen if the door of that tomb is rolled open. All the neighbors are going to smell all of Lazarus's sins. Right? And so she tries to stop him. But they roll back the, to the door of the tomb. And Jesus stands at the mouth of the tomb. And he says, Lazarus, <laughs> come forth. And Lazarus gets up and says, why in the world do I have these strings all around me? What is happening? It smells in here. What's going on? He gets up and he walks out. You see, this is Jesus. He's the subject of the verb. He's the actor. And so you, uh, when Jesus is preached, whenever the gospel is proclaimed, Jesus is the subject of the verb. Second... When the gospel is spoken, the hearers are identified as the beneficiary. Your sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. You are the beneficiary. You are identified as the one who benefits. So in the story of Lazarus, Lazarus is the beneficiary along with his sisters, huh? Mary and Martha. They're identified as the ones benefiting from Jesus. Then. Jesus' words have a name and address. They are for you. And so when the gospel is preached, you're identified as one who's getting something from him. Hmm? So when the gospel is proclaimed, huh, you can you say it directly and you identify it. A, the state of Oregon where I live in the summer has got a close correspondence with the state of Alaska. Lots of people come down from Alaska. We had a woman in our congregation who had come down from Alaska. She was a tough old woman. I just loved her. She had a stroke was a big stroke just about killed her she was sitting in the in the in a wheelchair in the emergency room i was called and i was sent to the hospital i got there as fast as i could i said to her when i saw her christ jesus has been preparing a place for you and it looks to me like it's just about ready. She said one word. She said, 
Good. That's the last word she ever spoke. <laughs> At her funeral, the whole congregation kept saying over and over again, Good. <laughs> you see, she's, she was the beneficiary. She knew herself to be a beneficiary. Christ Jesus is preparing a place for whom? For you. For you and you and you. This is what he does. He gives his benefits to you. So, when the gospel word is spoken, you know who it's addressed to. It's always addressed to you. It's always addressed to specific people. It's handed over. So when you're speaking to a sinner, you, you don't say something like this. Well, Jesus likes sinners, and I think you can take your chances on him. What do you say? Your sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. Huh? There's a big difference. The address, the address he is named. Thirdly, since Christ Jesus is the actor in the gospel, when the gospel word is spoken, it can be spoken, it should be, it is always spoken unconditionally. There are no ifs, ands, or buts in the gospel. There are no implied conditions in the gospel. When the gospel is spoken, the gospel says this, your sins, what? Are forgiven. When the gospel is spoken, it says this, you are being raised from the dead. You will be raised from the dead. When the gospel is spoken, what does it say? Nothing will shall separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not Huh? Not angels, not powers, not principalities, nothing. Hmm? When I, I went through a period of great difficulty in my life some years ago, and every night I prayed Luther's evening prayer. I began the day with the morning prayer, and I closed every night with the evening prayer. Every evening, this is what I said at the end of the prayer, let your holy angels have charge of me. <laughs> that the wicked one have no power over me. Let your holy angels have charged me that the wicked one have no power over me. I was teaching out on the west coast and living by myself. That's a bad time to have that kind of trouble when you're by yourself. Sometimes I would call Carolyn and I would say, you have to pray this with me. And we would say together, let the holy angels have charge of us that the wicked one have no power over us. You see? Here you go. Here's the gospel word. Hmm? Christ Jesus promises, what? That he will send his angels to take charge of you. Because if you're left in charge of yourself, you're in big trouble. Because if you're left alone with your thoughts, the tempter will overwhelm you. But when he sends the angels to take charge of you, huh? you have hope and joy and blessing. Right? You can survive, you can go on. So, because Christ is the speaker, it's dead certain. Because Christ is the speaker, you can count on it. Because Christ is the speaker, there's no possibility of failure. Because Christ is the speaker, you can be sure of this, that the job will be done. He is not short-handed that he cannot save. He doesn't do 75% and say, well, you should learn a little bit about this. I'll give you the last 25. He never goes part way, part way. He always goes all the way. He didn't say, Lazarus, you can come to the door of the tomb, but when you're ready for it, you can step out. He gives the whole gift of the gospel, the whole gift of the gospel, and he does it so that we can be certain of it. Here's the fourth rule. When the gospel is spoken, it always pushes into the present tense. The gospel never says, your sins will be forgiven. 
The gospel says your sins are forgiven. Even when the gospel says Christ will raise you from the dead, he is pushing into the present tense. He wants it. You remember this? Martha and Mary say, Yes, Lord, we know that in the last day he will raise the dead. And what does Jesus say? No, I am. I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. And so when you preach the gospel to someone, you say, He is your resurrection and he is your life. He will give himself to you. And he is giving himself to you even now. Hmm? So the gospel comes out of the future and it takes hold of you in the present. And it carries you into the future in Christ's hands. So that carried by Christ Jesus, you have a future that's certain and beyond question. If I look at myself, <laughs> good luck. Fighting chance, maybe. If I look at myself, I become quickly aware of all the risks. But if I look to Christ Jesus, what do I see? Certainty, power, promise. It, he will not fail you. Huh? He's not going to betray you. He's not going to get partway and say, man alive, have you gained weight? I mean, forget it. Huh? He's not going to get partway and say, I died for the sins of the world, but unfortunately I never had this in mind. I mean, when he, gets, when he forgives, he takes all of your sins upon himself. Every last one of them, he becomes sin for you. He becomes your sins. He becomes the sinner. The greatest sinner in the history of the human race. He has all the sins of Peter and Paul and all the sins of Mary and Martha and all the sins of Lazarus. He has the sins of the whole world, including all of yours. He is literally stinking with sin. He becomes sin for us so that he can turn to us in the promise of grace. That's the gospel word. So he goes outside of the camp. He gets crucified on Golgotha, where the temple offal is dumped. The steaming gut piles of all the sacrifices. He goes there to the most unclean place in the whole religious world. He goes there to be condemned. Huh? And carrying your condemnation, he goes to his death so he can turn to you and say, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the world was made. You can say that. Huh? You have the joy of saying that. You have the blessing of being able to say that to you, those that you love. Because you belong to Christ Jesus. You are his. He is yours. And this is what he says. He who hears you, hears me. Hmm? He who hears you, hears me. He puts himself on your lips so that you can carry the gospel word into the situations of everyday life and say it. Hmm? With joy, with confidence, with hope. Huh? I love it. Huh? There's nothing better than going into a disaster carrying that word with you. Because you're bringing the resurrection and the life. Huh? He is right beside you. So we go into the most horrible situations of life. Confident and hopeful. Because our Lord is our crucified and risen Savior. Who will never betray us. Huh? We have this certainty. And so can speak with joy. So this is not magic. This is no surefire recipe. But it's a good place to look. Hmm? You want to find words that are, that are, um, that because they're for words that are unconditional. You know the gospel's not going to happen if you throw people back on themselves. 
You know that the word is, the purpose of this word is to bring people out of themselves and bring them to rest in Christ. And these four little grammatical rules at least can help you stay focused. Christ is the subject of the word, of the, of the, of the verbs. He is the one acting. The hearer in front of you is the, is the direct object, the one who benefits from this word. Because Christ is the speaker of this word, you can say it unconditionally. And because Christ is the speaker of the word, he is coming out of the future into the present to do the gospel right now. Okay? Thank you very much.